Well, uh, I was thinking when I put the talk together that you heard everything today on what is currently being done. So I'm trying to give a little output, a little thought of how we'll do next year and the years after. And I structured the talk. We'll talk about oncogenic driver mutation, lung cancer, and we talk about immunotherapy. And I, there's no talk about chemotherapy because I don't think that's going to be much changed in the future. Uh, at the moment, for patients which have a non-small cell lung cancer with an activating EGFR mutation, where I practice, we have three drugs that can be used, gefitinib, erlotinib, and afatinib. And in my interpretation at the current time, it's more a marketing issue because the effect, effectiveness of all drugs is quite similar. What has been proven by a Japanese study and has been approved by the European medical agencies is the combination of bevacizumab in addition to erlotinib for patients with an activating mutation. And where I practice, this is now what we offer the patient as a first-line treatment when they have a EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And the approval was based on a six months improved progression-free survival with the combination. Now, however, all patients who have a very successful treatment with a EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor developed a, a drug resistance, and about 60% of patients, the reason for drug resistance is one mutation. It's a gatekeeper mutation. It's called T790M, and it renders the conventional drugs ineffective. And here is where we have already the future, where, where I practice. There are now drugs, and one drug has been approved by the European Medical Agency, the drug is called ozimertinib, and this drug is active against the resistance mutations much more than against the wild-type EGFR, in contrast to the other drugs which are really inactive with the resistance mutation. Now, today, the treatment where I practice is a first-line EGFR TKI combined with bevacizumab. On progression, we'll do a biopsy. If the biopsy tumor biopsy or liquid biopsy proves uh, resistance by T790M we treat with ozimertinib. The, for most patients with these oncogenic driver adenocarcinomas of the lung, eventually during the time of their disease, and they live many years nowadays, they develop brain metastasis or even leptomeningeal disease. And this is a devastating situation up to now. Because it has been shown, and this has been presented at the ESCO this year, that this drug ozimertinib has a very good penetration to the CSF. And patients who had documented leptomeningeal metastasis had a profit from treating with ozimertinib. And this really provides a new, a new hope for those patients. But why, why I bring that, this is already maybe current treatment, but it's the future. In the phase one study with ozimertinib on patients with an activating EGFR mutation, look at this progression-free survival that has been documented. The progression-free survival has been 19.3 months, almost two years. And this is double of the progression-free survival we observe currently with the current EGFR TKIs. So if this is proven by the randomized trial calling, called FLAURA, which has fully accrued, I'm quite convinced that ozimertinib will be the first-line treatment for all patients in EGFR, uh, TKI, uh, EGFR mutation. Also, it's more active, but it has much less side effects. Why? because the drug does not inhibit potently the wild-type EGFR. So this is the way how things will going for the EGFR-mutated non-small cell lung cancer. The thing is, of course, 
the approval of the drug is based on a documentation of T790M mutation. And where I practice, we do rebiopsy, uh, EBUS, uh, aggressive rebiopsy of the patients. But there is a new way to do that, and it's called liquid biopsy. In the blood, there's circulating free DNA, and you can prove in the blood the presence of T790M mutations. And the sensitivity of a plasma test is, oh, is 80%. So the, the scenario is you have a patient with progressive disease, you do a blood test, T790M is proven, you switch to the other drug, or T790M is not proven in the blood, and what you then do, you do a tissue biopsy, as we do now. Now, the other uh, oncogenic driver the tumor is ALK. And of course, also, uh, there is a progression-free survival with crisotinib of uh, maybe 10 months, and all patients eventually develop resistance. But the situation in ALK oncogenic-driven tumors is different from the EGFR-driven uh, tumors. Here, there is not just one dominant resistance mutations, but a series of different resistance mutations. And now, and this will be the future, we could, can inquire what is the resistance mutation, and hopefully in the future, three, four, five drugs will be available, and we can choose the right drug for the right tumor for the right patient. How is this development ongoing? So currently, a patient where we practice is treated with crisotinib for an ALK-driven tumor. There is a progressive disease. And without doing another biopsy, now there is an EMA approval of treating the patient with seritinib. And again, as you can see with this waterfall blood, you can again get the benefit of 8, 10, 12 months progression-free survival. There is another drug, Alectinid, is not yet proved, uh, uh, approved in Europe, which has the same activity for patients which have a re resistance to crisotinib. So two great options. Now, uh, just to go a little bit to the fine tuning, and I marked here two mutations. One mutation is G1202R. And when these mutations occurs on progression to chrysotinib, alectinib, and seritinib are, have no effect. But there are two new drugs. One is called brigatinib, the other is called loratinib, and there have been communication at ESCO this year about those two drugs, which will provide great option for the patients in the future. This is lorlatinib. For patients with ALK-positive tumor who have progressed on crisotinib, it has a medium progression-free survival of, again, over one year. And the drug is quite well tolerated and penetrates very well to the brain. This is documented brain responses on patients who were treated with lorlatinib, which have progressed on crisotinib. And that is another change in the paradigm nowadays if patients with those oncogenic driver mutations uh, develop brain metastases, it's not just a reflex to do whole brain radiation. There is other options which are much more gentle to the patient is to change the drug and get an effect with the medicine. The other drug is Brigatinib. Again, this has, shown to, has been shown at uh, this year's ASCO meeting. Again, a drug which has activity to certain resistance mutations and has a very good penetration to the brain. But this is how it will change. I explained to you the change that will happen with EGFR mutated patients with Ozimertinib having such a long PFS. This has been a randomized study which has compared alectinib, a potential new standard, to crisotinib, the current standard, in Japanese patients with ALK-driven tumor without previous, they were not, not previously treated. And what you can see here, a medium progre progression-free survival of alectinib has not been reached, and the hazard ratio is 0.34. The big global study has fully accrued, and it, it will read out the end of the next year, but I have no doubt that in the future, electinib 
is most likely going to be the first choice and the best choice for our patients. And I say that again because of brain metastasis. This was a forest plot analysis, and then they looked at patients who had brain metastasis prior to the treatment, and you see here a hazard ratio of 0 0.08 in favor of alectinib. This is a hazard ratio I've never seen anywhere before. It is a drug which is well tolerated and very active in the brain. Now, these are just the two common mutations, but nowadays, theoretically, if you were able to test the molecular profile of the tumor of your patients, there are a wide range of options, option based on case reports, on small series, and I'm going to just summarize those options here with you. Uh, we know that ROS1 fusion occurs also in 1% of patients, and crisotinib has been proven to be very active with a progression-free survival of 19 months. So this is where I practice. We look for ROS1, and crisotinib is the standard of care. Her two mutations are present in adenocarcinoma. There are a series of drugs. Probably the best is afatinib, and we examine that and treating patients in a clinical study. Met can be amplified, and again, crisotinib has been proven activity for patients with a MET-amplified tumor. There can also be mutations in MET, an exon 14 deletion of MET, which uh, prevents the protein from degradation and keeps it active. It's an oncogenic driver, and again, crisotinib is active in this situation. There is red fusions, and there is a series of drugs which have shown activity. We are doing a very large study in Europe with alectinib for this situation. And recently, two years ago, there has been another fusion described, NTRAC fusions, and there is a drug, entractinib, which is effective in NTRAC, ROS, and ALK, and this is currently undergoing clinical testing. And what is already available for patients who have a BRAF mutation is the combination of dabrafenib and trametinib. It's the combination that we use for patients with melanoma who have a BRAF V600 mutation. At the moment, there is also HER2 amplification in a certain number of uh, lung cancers, and TDM1 is a drug which is currently undergoing uh, examination, a drug used in breast cancer for those patients. And I'm going to skip all the details because I summarized that uh, uh, with my talk, and I'm going to go over to the immunotherapy. I'm sure you heard today the great developments in immunotherapy, and uh, I'm, I'm giving a glimpse what I think will happen as the next steps. So the, I'm going to talk about development of combinations, immune checkpoint inhibitors as the first line of treatment, and then immune check inhibitors as adjuvant therapy. This has the data of the two big studies with nivolumab on patients with squamous cell carcinoma and non-squamous cell carcinoma the checkmate 017 and 057. And there has been a survival update presented at ESCO this year. And what has been seen, a two-year survival of patient treated in second line uh, with nivolumab of 23%. Again, it's felt that in this indication, there is very likely a plateau, and some patients dramatically profit for very long with nivolumab. There is also an overall survival of two years for nivolumab for patients with non-squamous cell carcinoma. Here, the, the data seems to be a little less mature because we do not know yet whether there's really going to be a plateau at the end of this curve. But again, where I practice now, the treatment for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer is for squamous cell carcinoma, cisplatin, pemetrec, uh, uh, gemcitabine, 
And for adenocarcinoma, cisplatin pemetrex to pemetrex maintenance, or carboplatin paclitaxel bevacizumab. But on progression, the treatment is an immune checkpoint inhibitor as a standard treatment. Where I practice, nivolumab is approved in the United States. There is also pembrolizumab approved in the situation. Again, as nivolumab, pembrolizumab has shown a survival benefit for patients who have at least 1% of tumor cells positive for the target PDL1 and a survival benefit compared to the previous second line treatment, which has been docetaxel. And the advances, as we all know, is not just there is a survival be benefit of immunotherapy, but the immunotherapy is much better tolerated than the chemotherapy with docetaxel. Now, a question, and I hope the future will help us to decide, decide that, is how long should you treat a patient? It's a very expensive treatment. In the clinical studies, patients have been treated even beyond progression or in certain studies for one year or for two years until the treatment was stopped. And we have no idea whether or not a shorter treatment and a retreatment if needed might be as good as not. I give you, the, there's a patient of my clinic. He was 70 years old. He had a stage four adenocarcinoma of the lung. He said, I'm too old, I don't want chemotherapy, but we had a study open, and he took part in the study with an uh, atezolizumab, which is an antibody to PDL1. The patients have two doses, two weeks apart, no side effects, and the tumor went away. And the patient said, despite I'm on the study, I'm fine now, I'm not going to continue. Why should I? So, he stopped after two, two treatments. Nine months later, he had a progression uh, in the CT scan of one of the lesions uh, seen before. The other lesions didn't reappear. This lesion was radiated with stereotactic radiotherapy, and the patient is still doing fine. So I hope in the future we will have studies and we will learn how to use immune checkpoint inhibitors also in an efficient and cost-saving way. Now, at the moment, the indication is for second-line treatment. And the question is, should it replace chemotherapy for the first-line treatment of patients with metastatic disease? So first question here that was looked at, is there a difference in response rate to atezolizumab, Anti, uh, antibody against CTLA, uh, against uh, PDLA1, and patients were treated in third line, in second line, or in first line, and there was no difference in response. There has been in an expanded phase one trial, a phase one trial with over 1,000 patients, with uh, pembrolizumab, and this is a cohort of patients who had no prior treatment before giving immunotherapy, metastatic disease. And you see here the progression-free survival in green for patients in whose tumor the expression of PDL1 was very strong by immunistic chemistry. The progression-free survival, uh, 12 months. This is never seen with chemotherapy. And then the overall survival, the medium was not reached for those patients. So an indication that for some patients, maybe particularly those which have a very strong PDL1 expression, immune checkpoint inhibitors in the future will be the treatment of choice. Now I'm talking about combination. In melanoma, it has been documented, at least numerically, that ipilimumab, the previous standard of care, which provides a cure for patients with metastatic melanoma. It has been, uh, the results were better with nivolumab and less toxic, and the results were further improved combining a CTLA-4 antibody, ipilimumab, with a PD-1 antibody, nivolumab. 
And in melanoma, it seems that tumors that were PDL1 positive, did n those patients did not benefit from using the combination which was more toxic. But patients who had a PDL1 P negative tumor seemed to benefit from the combination. Now, this is also being looked at in lung cancer. This has been presented at ESCO, but also published in Lancet Oncology. It was a, a quite complex study, but if you simplify, it was using a CTLA-4 antibody, a tremolimumab from AstraZeneca, with a PDL1 antibody, durvalumab from AstraZeneca in combination in patients with uh, first line non small cell lung cancer. And what was seen in this pilot study was there was a good response, but it seems when you look at the color codes, PDL1 positive, PDL1 negative, gray not available, it seemed not to matter whether the tumor expressed PDL1. Now, I make a bracket. When somebody says express PDL1, you need to question what the hell do they mean? Because any drug company makes a different definition. The definition here is to have 25% of cells positive. So another company may use another cutoff to say what is positive and negative. So it's not so easy to compare between studies. But anyway, when they looked at those patients treated with combination PDL1 positive, PDL1 negative, according to their scoring, there seems to be no difference in response, and this is the time on remission uh, for those patients, which is, you know, it's still weeks, so it's early, but it's the way things will move. There was another presentation in ASCO, now this again, a CTLA-4 antibody, ipilimumab, together with nivolumab, and it was looking at different combinations, what might be the best combination to take forward to phase three studies. And uh, the, what, what could be shown is the combination here, when you look at grade three or four toxicity, you know, there was significant grade three, four toxicity as compared to nivolumab alone, almost double. But looking at treatment-related adverse event, which led to discontinuation of the treatment, it was not really different whether they used the combination or the uh, nivolumab alone. Essentially is when people get experience, they know how to deal with this issue. The side effects occur, but in most cases, there's no need to stop the treatment. What was shown in terms of response rate is that this was the response rate of nivolumab alone, 23%, with nivolumab 3 milligram every two weeks and ipilimumab 1 milligram every 12 weeks. The response rate went up to confirmed response to 47%. And it was not really those patients that seemed like in the melanoma who were PDL1 negative. Gray is uh, uh, nivolumab, blue is the combination. It's about the same here, but ev all other patients had a better response rate by independent of the degree of PDL1 positivity by the combination. And now, uh, to close the circle, uh, we have a press release from Merck. So they had the Keynote 24 study, which at the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, the secondary endpoint overall survival. It was a standard chemotherapy versus pembrolizumab in patients who had 50% of more tumor cells BDL1 positive by the assay. And the Independent Data Monitoring Committee closed, uh, suggested to close the trial because they had reached its endpoint early. And this will be communicated most likely at the ESMO meeting. So that will be, I'm sure, lead to the approval of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor first line, at least for those cohort of patients. At the moment, there are about 15,000 patients worldwide in clinical studies 
which look at questions using immune checkpoint inhibitors versus chemotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors and chemotherapy versus chemotherapy, or combination of immune checkpoint inhibitors versus chemotherapy. And in two or three years, the field will be quite clear. And I'm thinking, thinking of the future. There will be a proportion of patients, like the EGFR mutated patients, there will be a proportion of patients which have an inflamed tumor, which will have a first line treatment with immune therapy, and chemotherapy comes later on. And what now, of course, one looks also at the combination, stage three disease, there's no advantage in stage three disease, it's chemoradiotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery. And there are now big studies looking at adding immune checkpoint inhibitors to chemoradiotherapy. And of course, there is the issue when melanoma, there is cure for metastatic disease, can we increase the cure rate for uh, patients with non-small cell lung cancer and uh, uh, who had surgery. And we have a big trial, a European trial of 1,400 patients. It's called the PEARLS trial, which adds pembrolizumab or placebo for one year after radical surgery. And that completes the non-small cell part. And uh, I can tell you, at in ESMO, we will have the two major trials in, in Copenhagen in October. So maybe one of the other of you will join there. The last year we had ESMO Singapore. We had the most important keynote trial there. And we hope for some of the immunotherapy trial there. And uh, we have in the lung field a yearly European meeting, European lung cancer meeting. It takes usually place in Geneva in April or May. And uh, this is hello from my hometown. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from audience? Вопросы есть, профессор Устальев? Questions to professor. Excellent presentation. And uh, if you can, a few words about small cell lung cancer and immunotherapy. What do you think about it? Yeah, if you sh uh, switch on the slides, and I will uh, show you okay. some slides. If, if you can go back to my talk. Because in small cell lung cancer, we have nothing for decades, yeah. and uh, nowadays maybe you so can I, I, I mean, see. It's going to be a second, because I had it at the end, because I had to talk about non-small cell, yes. I left it out. But I can, while I switch, say there is going to be immunotherapy for mesothelioma. We will have an ETOP trial uh, looking at second line chemotherapy single agents versus pembrolizumab, and uh, there are early indications that it's active in melanoma. To what degree, we don't know yet. So, small cell, yeah. Well, there's two issues on small cell. One is, there has never been a targeted therapy in small cell. And we heard uh, at the ESMO Vienna, and uh, again at, at ASCO, the same data, an update, there is a surface protein, which is called DDL3, in small cell lung cancer, in other neuroendocrine diseases. And there has been an antibody drug conjugate targeted to surface protein DDL3. And what you see here is the objective response in patients who had heavily pretreated patients with small cell lung cancer. The objective response was 18% overall, and 39% in about a third of patients who have a very strong expression of DDL3. So this is moving forward uh, and will provide some new hope for small cell lung cancer. There has been publication, uh, communication, uh, at, I think it was at AACR last year, on Keynote 28, it was a cohort of patients with malignant mesothelioma. Now, like all the studies that have been done by Merck, Sharp, and Tome, 
They had a selection of patients. They had to have at least a, light, a little bit of PDL1 positivity in the tumor. But those patients that entered the study, they had a response rate, which I think was 28%, and this was the, the waterfall plot in those patients with small cell lung cancer. Now, there has been a trial looking at nivolumab alone or nivolumab plus ipilimumab in relapsed small cell lung cancer. You see here, this is the spaghetti plot of nivolumab alone. This is the spaghetti plot of nivolumab 3 milligram and ipilimumab 1. And this ipilimumab 3 and nivolumab 1 milligram per square meter every two weeks. And the best results were found in this area, there's clear activity in refractory small cell lung cancer. And again, when you look at the combination, uh, it's going to, the standard will be uh, NIVO 1, EP3. Yes, there is, of course, uh, uh, some grade 3 or 4 toxicity which one has to deal with, which is higher than the toxicity with nivolumab, nivolumab alone, but the uh, response rate is also higher. So these were the data that was in, in the Lancet Oncology. Red is the curve of patients who had NIVO 1 EP3, progression-free survival in refractory non-small cell lung cancer, and overall survival, uh, and this is months. So how many patients that you know have a second-line treatment and are still alive at more than a year when we, with the current chemotherapy? Practically none. So, in order to really prove, we want to increase the cure rate, we do a study uh, on ETOP which takes patients who agree to take part who have limited disease small cell lung cancer. They have the standard chemo radiotherapy and PCI, and afterwards there's randomization between consolidation or observation. Uh, the consolidation is with this combination which is best, it's a NIVO 1 EP3. And this trial is now ongoing in Europe. We have, I think, about 40 patients so far on the trial. And we hope with this we can incure, improve the cure rate from the start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.